Hello, thank you for watching. This is a satellite loop of last Friday, March 1st. I'll play this here. This was uh, kind of day two, really kind of maybe day and a half, the beginning of the blizzard event that we saw through the weekend in California, particularly the Sierra Nevadas. I like this one because if you kind of see those high milky white clouds there, that is really the jet stream kind of coming through in terms of those visible clouds. We can see there the strong, fast moving winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. We follow those, uh, right, the forecast for the jet stream to determine what's gonna happen on the ground here. Uh, well, in this case, they were uh, slamming up against uh, the Sierra Nevadas. That brought the heavy moisture up into the area. You can kind of see that. If you look closely at the cloud field here, uh, streaming up the mountains, that's your orographic lift, taking that warm, moist Pacific air, bringing it up the mountains, it snows, and that's how we ended up with uh, nearly 10 feet. I think there was a 10 foot snow total, at least if you add up the whole weekend, a uh, four or five day event there. Uh, kind of lower level, uh, you know, some of the more populated areas, we maybe got to about half that. I'm gonna replay that because that's just a cool loop. Um, got to about maybe half a little bit below that in some of the more populated areas, but that's still a tremendous amount of snow, four to five feet. And, you know, we've talked about this uh, kind of felt like all spring or late winter here. We were looking to get more snow in the Sierra Nevada, some other areas, the Northern Rockies, the Northern Cascades as well. We got it uh, over the last four days. Um, but against that jet stream coming down the picture of the polar jet stream, it's a bit colder, brings colder air that lowers the snow levels in terms of elevation. And that just increases the total snow amount getting to the basin. And the result of that after this weekend snow total is we're back above average now in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, other areas in the uh, inner mountain basin or the Rockies here, we are at or above average as well. If you go north of the Columbia and Snake Rivers, that's an area we've been concerned about here this spring. They got some snow, a pretty good amount of snow here over the last uh, seven days since we last talked as well. This map looks a lot better than it did uh, going way back to January 1st. In fact, why don't I just take us back here to January 5th and uh, see where that uh, that updates here. Let's see if that will update for January. There we go. So there is uh, where we were in terms of departures for average all the way back January 5th, two months ago. So well, well below average in Sierra Nevada is 27% of average all the way up the Cascades. Um, you know, even east of the Sierra Nevadas in the Intermountain Basin, really kind of the Colorado River source area, we were about half, if not below that in some areas uh, there. And, you know, coming up to where we're at now, just a huge improvement over the last two months. If you think about last year, we were kind of strengthening the El Nino. We were warming up those waters in the tropical Pacific. El Nino was getting stronger and stronger. It peaked in December, maybe tried to peak again in early January. It's been weakening a bit since then. We're definitely going to talk about that at the end of this video. But we talked about the potential, you know, for the snow, the rain to come maybe later in the winter. And we've had that uh, in a big way. It just kind of shows you, you got to wait until you get through the whole water year to kind of see where things lay. And uh, this year is a great example of that. So we're getting into the forecast. Um, you know, I do want to cover just a few more things. Uh, I talked about the Northern Rockies. This is looking at the last five days of accumulated snowfall. Uh, we talked about the Sierra Nevadas, the tremendous amount of snow there. I'm kind of product of the jet stream level winds coming right over the crest of the Sierra Nevada as being, you know, 14,000 feet up into the air. We actually had a 190 mile an hour wind gust uh, recorded at the crest of the Sierras. Now, fortunately, not a lot of people uh, were up there this weekend. That was kind of the goal with the forecast and the warnings uh, that went out. Uh, but nonetheless, shows you the tremendous power of the storm uh, and the fast moving winds there. Even at times, you know, Friday night into Saturday morning, there were reports that it was getting hard to take measurements uh, of the snow. One, you know, we don't want people out in the snow when you have below freezing temperatures, 190 mile an hour winds, and you know, three to four inches of snow falling per hour. That is um, not life threatening to say the least. But of course, the drifting, the blowing snow, it's hard to get an accurate measurement of snow over time when that's the case. But uh, a tremendous amount of snow in the Sierra is kind of going off the color bar on this map, which peaks out at four feet. So not nearly enough to capture uh, the range of snow totals they can get there over a five day period. But other areas, the Southern Cascades, the Northern Cascades, getting over a foot, if not two feet plus in some areas, uh, Idaho, uh, Elevation, Salmon River Mountains areas, and the uh, Intermountain West as well, getting some snowfall out of the event over the last five days. So this was a good, uh, I think, early March event uh, for a number of areas, not just the Sierras, in terms of improving that snowpack as we go out into, you know, another summer that's not far away. It's not gonna be too many weeks from now we're talking about potentially heat advisories uh, and things of that nature and strong uh, evaporative demand. So building these snowpacks up now, getting those reservoirs up uh, to help us through another year is gonna relieve any kind of prospects of drought, certainly in California, the Willamette Valley and some of these other areas going forward. Want to catch us up on uh, what's happening here today. This uh, 
uh, not a scientific term, this little fella here, this is a low pressure system uh, spinning just uh, off the coast of Southern California here today, bringing moderate showers uh, into Southern California. You can see the Santa Barbara, Ventura counties area getting uh, heavy showers here, just looking down at the visible satellite imagery. This is recorded here uh, just after lunchtime Pacific. So these showers likely by the time uh, you know this video gets to have been making its way uh, inland over Southern California, Los Angeles County, San Diego. We're expecting rainfall out of this. Uh, not a huge uh, flooding threat, just kind of uh, making the day a little bit rainier and wetter here across Southern California. Not as potent of some of the flooding events, certainly, that we've talked about uh, here in 2024. Uh, but nonetheless, it looks pretty neat. It looks like there's a little thunderstorm or shower head kind of right at the middle of this uh, tight low pressure system spinning here off the coast of California, spinning counterclockwise. Uh, just kind of a neat little feature here. And then there are winter weather advisories up in some of the higher elevations, uh, which where some of this right, at high enough elevation could fall as snow here as we go through the night uh, tonight into Thursday morning. Jump over here and look at the radar imagery kind of over that same area there. You can see some spotty showers popping up over central and southern California. The rain shower is now moving inland across southern California associated with the spinning low. If you look closely, that is where that center of rotation or that center of that low pressure system is spinning there. Again, just west of uh, the coast of California here. This will make its way inland uh, tonight into Thursday. We'll talk through that in just a second here in the forecast, potentially bringing some rain to Arizona as we go through the day tomorrow. Uh, one thing I did want to talk about, it feels like it's been a few of these videos, a few seven day forecasts in a row where we're talking about uh, cold risks uh, for the Western US, whether that be California, uh, whether it just be cold temperatures overall across the whole you know, Western US region. We've been talking about the polar jet uh, being more dominant. So uh, colder snow levels or lower snow levels, I should say more uh, snow for the Northern Cascades or the Pacific Northwest, rain in the Willamette Valley. We've been kind of stuck in a similar pattern. Uh, just, uh, I don't know if there are any other way to explain it here. What I want to highlight here is kind of this persistent uh, nature of the pattern we've had. Here's Hawaii, kind of right at the center of our map. This, we're looking down at the Pacific Ocean here. The subtropical jet, which was really kind of the dominating feature, certainly for California and all the flooding rains we saw, the subtropical jet was dominating really kind of as we went through the end of January and then into early to mid-February. That gave way here over the last two weeks to the polar jet. That has been coming really down out of Alaska and has brought the blizzard here that we talked about last weekend, brought some of the heavy snow events before that as well. And that pattern, I think, is going to continue going forward, and we've been stuck with it for a while, but there are hints of it changing. And what I mean by this pattern, you can really kind of start it further west in the Pacific. The subtropical jet has been shunted well to the south. It's kind of been focusing on Cabo, uh, if anywhere else, uh, coming even south of Hawaii. We typically think of this as maybe going from Kauai to San Diego during some of these uh, El Nino events, but it's been even further south than that. That's really kept it out of the uh, picture here for the west, save for this little low pressure system spinning some rain into the San Diego area, probably by the time you're watching this video. The dominant piece has been the polar jet stream. This is the more northern branch of the jet stream, higher up on the globe here. And that has brought these systems in through the northwest, the Willamette Valley, getting a lot of rainfall. Heavy snow in the Cascades, right? That's built back up those snow deficits that we just looked at on the map before. But I'm looking for a, a pattern change here because if you look north of Hawaii, we've had this upper level ridge in the jet stream flow that is a mountain in the jet stream flow, if you will, west of the continental US. And often in the atmosphere, what goes up comes down. So while we've had this ridging here in the East Pacific, we've naturally had this troughing develop in the Western US. That's brought in cold temperatures, it's brought in snow at times, it's brought in rain to the Pacific Northwest, and it's really kept daily temperatures suppressed over the last two weeks. That's the forecast, I'll just get right into it. That's the forecast we're expecting really over the next seven days, but I think we're finally gonna kick this ridge out of here in the North Central Pacific and give us something of a pattern change uh, moving forward, looking out at the end of the next week. So maybe kind of seven to 10 to 10 to 14 day forecast. We got high temperature anomalies today. This is from the National Weather Service. This is relative to average, and you can just see those cold temperatures still uh, the case here across the Western US in terms of those high temperatures. Well, we have that ridge North of Hawaii, we have that troughing over the West Junior S that's bringing these cold temperatures. It's influencing this low pressure system over Southern California. This is kind of the pattern we've been stuck in. I've kind of been repeating it now over the last uh, week or two. I wanna take that jet stream back uh, to present here. This is valid as a Wednesday evening. We just talked about this upper level ridge west of the continental US, right? This upper level ridge here, dipping down into a trough that's brought cold temperatures into the Western US. Let's take this forecast out into the future. We see finally a little bit of a trough moving in now in that same area, uh, opening up into a ridge over the western US. That's not, not necessarily the pattern change 
uh, that I'm looking for because this is going to happen so quickly. It's going to be uh, transiting the area quickly. So we might get this little break here going into Friday uh, in the weekend. We quickly replace that with this uh, short wave trough coming through. This is going to bring back rain and snow from the Pacific Northwest and the Cascades, Northern California, as well as that swings through. And just as quickly as we had maybe that, you know, the little pattern change there, now we have a big upper level ridge developing back north of Hawaii. This is what I mean when I say the next seven days looking more of the same. If I take that forecast into the future out into Sunday and Monday, we have this troughing now dominating back over the western U.S., likely bringing cooler weather, rainfall for the Willamette Valley, intermountain snow, cascade snow as well. Uh, good news in terms of working off those deficits there. But, you know, not good news if uh, we're looking to kick out of this cooler pattern that we've been stuck in for the western half of the country. So I take the pattern into Tuesday, now March 12th, getting out into the middle of March here. If you look north of Hawaii and you were to describe the jet stream level flow, again, you can see this ridging in the jet stream, this kind of upside down you, the mountain in the jet stream. And I apologize here, I have a, uh, a backup mouse I'm working with because uh, my other one needed to charge uh, during this video and it's kind of skipping around a little bit. But nonetheless, you can see that upper level ridge here and how that naturally just works itself into a trough over the western US. This is all the way now out into March 12th, six day forecast at this point. But as I take the forecast into Wednesday and finally into Thursday, now we have something of a more material pattern change. Now if we look north of Hawaii, uh, this couldn't be described as anything other than a trough. We flipped uh, the pattern around there. Now we have this big long wave ridging over the Northeast Pacific, now pushing into the Western US coastline at least, Oregon, Western Washington, and parts of California. And taking the forecast well out even toward next weekend, uh, we dominate that upper level ridging across the western U.S. Warm temperatures would be the case in parts of uh, Washington, Oregon, California if this forecast comes to uh, fruition. Now, the forecast I just showed you is uh, we are all the way out into Friday of next week. So seven, eight, nine day forecast, the confidence is going to go down a little bit. But there is some consistency looking at a number of different models that we might be seeing this pattern change uh, looking out in the future. At the very least, um, you know, it's uh, something to talk about in terms of not repeated snowfall events or cold temperature risks or frost risks in California going into next week. If we get the seven day temperature anomalies from the ECMWF, so taking the forecast out into the middle of next week, because that pattern didn't really change until the end of next week, we see those cold temperatures continuing to dominate across this next seven days. And with that polar branch of the jet stream kind of swinging these troughs in really through the weekend, I think this is going to be more pronounced. We see these uh, higher precipitation anomalies for the Pacific Northwest, really kind of the same areas that we've been talking about getting precipitation, save for the Sierra Nevadas, which are starting to shift drier now over the next seven days. And that could continue even a bit beyond that uh, as well. We'll talk about that in just a second here. Look at the national blend of models, just looking at the snowfall forecast over the next seven days, taking us out into Wednesday, March 13th. Not the heaviest snow, kind of seven day forecast that we've seen here this winter. We are adding some additional snowfall here to the Pacific Northwest, parts of the Cascades, Southern Cascades as well, perhaps some getting into Idaho uh, and the Northern Rockies as well. I don't think this is gonna be enough to really make a big dent in the deficits, but we'll take it. It's gonna kind of keep us uh, where we're at, which is just below average. Um, we'll take the snowfall, looking maybe for a more material uh, big event to help us get us back to average. Not sure we're going to see that here as we go through March. We'll keep an eye on the forecast uh, going forward, but um, I think kind of the deficits we see now we might uh, be sticking with a bit longer, uh, unfortunately, going through the summer. The good news is we've improved them a lot since uh, we saw that map on January 5th, just uh, at the beginning of this video. Not looking at uh, a lot of serious snowfall either, but uh, Fortunately, here now into mid-March, we're going in with average to above average snowpack uh, at this point in March. Let's take this forecast one to give you an idea of the uh, forecast precipitation and type here going forward over the next seven days. If I make this valid as of Wednesday evening, there's that low pressure system spinning over Southern California. Like I said, likely by the time this video gets out, uh, rainfall will be overspreading Los Angeles, parts of San Diego as well, going through the evening commute. And you'll see as I take this forecast into tonight, it's going to be skipping over the high elevations of uh, Southern California and getting into Eastern Arizona, Southern Arizona on Thursday and Thursday evening before working its way out of the area. The next system associated with one of those troughs that we talked about coming in via the polar jet stream will be impacting the Willamette Valley, parts of Western Washington, the Cascades, Northern California as we go into the weekend on Saturday. Potentially an additional piece of that coming on Sunday. 
And then even early week, we might be seeing yet another system coming through uh, as we go through the day, Tuesday, March 12th here, impacting parts of Northern California, perhaps precipitation getting all the way into central in the San Joaquin Valley of California here uh, as we go into uh, Tuesday, March 12th, uh, with wi widespread rain now in the Willamette Valley uh, at that time as well. That exiting sometime Wednesday, again, 70 forecast at this point. But there's, there's that clear up. So I've taken this out now to Friday, March 15th, all the way out into the end of next week. We get, you know, much more summer-like look, warmer temperatures overspreading the western coastline, some rain uh, lingering here in eastern Arizona. Um, but this looks very different uh, than what we've looked at over the last 30 days where somewhere uh, someone is getting some system. Some low pressure system is creating through, somebody's getting snow, somebody's getting rain, somebody's getting wind. Not seeing a lot of that here going into the next week as that high pressure system uh, and that upper level ridge try to dominate. If we got total precipitation uh, over the next seven days, we can see the Willamette Valley, Pacific Northwest, the same areas we talked about getting above average precipitation. Uh, we can see in these absolute terms the higher amounts there. Um, the values here in Southern California falling uh, really over the next 24 hours and then getting into Eastern Arizona as well. Um, but even with that system trying to come through middle of the week next week, not seeing a tremendous amount of rain or snowfall getting into parts of uh, California over the next seven day forecast, save for some showers potentially on Tuesday. This is looking at upper level uh, heights uh, here in their anomalies. Uh, I want to take you out into the future here, into the forecast to show you what I mean by that upper level ridging. So this is here uh, as of uh, Wednesday evening going into Thursday. And uh, like we've seen so much over the last two weeks, there's the troughing dominating over the Western US. If I take this forecast out into the future, you'll see the brief upper level ridging that we try to get uh, going into the weekend that quickly gets replaced by the trough and the uh, precipitation impacting the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Western Washington, Northern California. So I take that into next week, you can see that troughing lingering in the Pacific Northwest through Tuesday and Wednesday, but finally getting to the end of next week, Thursday, now into Friday, now into Saturday. Again, next weekend, 10 day forecast at this point, uh, but a pretty strong signal of ridging here dominating, well, at least over the Pacific Northwest, likely over California, Nevada, Idaho as well keeping precipitation away from those areas, bringing some warm weather back in, more spring-like or even uh, early summer-like temperatures. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this. It's not, uh, you know, there's no home runs in 10-day forecasting, so there'll be changes to this. Um, we'll see if there's small changes or more big changes, but right now pretty strong agreement that we're seeing something of a pattern change where north of Hawaii, which is over here on this map, we've replaced it with a big trough that naturally is trying to bring in some ridging into the Western US, changing the paradigm that we've seen uh, really through the end of February and early March here. If we get the Climate Prediction Center, their 8 to 14 day outlook really over that same time period. Now well below average uh, chances here for precipitation for the Northwest, aligning with what we saw with that ridging trying to dominate. As you can imagine, if we go over and look at the temperature uh, conversation, warmer uh, than average temperatures likely again over March 14th to March 20th, getting through the middle to late uh, part of uh, March here. One thing we noticed kind of at the end of February is the March forecast from the ECMWF extended forecast we're trying to shift. Uh, drier uh, for California and even at sometimes the Pacific Northwest as well. We saw a lot of rain in early March, obviously saw a tremendous amount of snow in the Sierra Nevadas. We saw improvements to the northern Cascade snowpack, improvements to the northern Rockies and Intermountain West uh, snowpack as well. So we were thinking, was it too premature? Was March maybe going to be one of these miracle marches? Well, we, I think it's safe to say that just with the weekend snowfall we had for California, you could qualify that as a miracle March type event. But the forecasts have still been consistent that at least going to the end of March, we're going to shift drier across parts of the Pacific Northwest, potentially the Sierra Nevadas as well. And at least that kind of week two forecast I just gave you, that's consistent with March ending a bit drier and potentially a bit warmer as well. Um, the forecast still aggressively dry going through the end of March into early April for parts of the Pacific Northwest and the Sierra Nevadas. I mentioned that the deficits we're kind of working with now uh, for the Northern Cascades and the Northern Rockies, these might be kind of baked in now as we go into summer because this long range forecast is not looking particularly uh, wet in those areas of anything much more on the dry end uh, and maybe even including the Sierra Nevadas. So the snowpack we have now, some improvement over the next seven days, not a ton, not enough to get us back to average in the uh, some of the Northern regions here. Only small amounts, uh, additional amounts for the Sierra Nevadas. So I think what we have here in early March might be pretty close to what we're working with now going into the snow melt season. Now, those March temperatures have also, in that long range forecast, been very cold. We've seen that over the last, I think, five to six days of March. I think we're going to see that over the next seven days of March. So perhaps, um, you know, fairly accurate for the first half of the month. But finally, looking at this now over that same time period, the end of March, 
getting into early April. Uh, these aren't as cold. It's not as magnified as a cold signal. And, and if anything, if you kind of look over in these western coastal regions, getting back toward average in terms of that forecast for temperature anomalies, maybe even slightly above average. And we have to be mindful, we do have a little bit of a, a warm water signal here off the coast of California, Oregon, uh, and Washington right now. We just got some new seasonal uh, forecasts out. I wanted to show you these uh, from the ECMWF came out uh, in early March here. Um, this is a forecast for El Nino. So um, again, I talked about how we peaked sometime in December for January for El Nino. The forecast since then have been calling for El Nino to weaken. Going into the summer months here, that's the expectation and that is uh, a very common evolution for El Nino going into the uh, new year. Uh, we're seeing that El Nino is weakening. We've come down off that peak uh, since January and December. And the forecast, all the various forecasts from the ECMWF here have this weakening further as we go into these summer months here. Now, the degree of weakening uh, is the big question going forward. It's the biggest question I'm asking myself now in terms of what next water year, it feels way too early to be talking about that, but what next water year might look like in California, parts of Arizona, the Colorado River, um, the Pacific Northwest, etc., is gonna largely depend at some point on whether we're in a La Nina, El Nino, or neither. Now, the chances are right now if this continues to weaken, that at some point near the end of the year, we could get into a La Nina. If that were to persist into the next water year, we'd be talking about a La Nina water year where we maybe have more precipitation in the Pacific Northwest, but we have more drought risk across California, more drought risk across uh, some of the interior areas of uh, Arizona and Nevada as well. Right now, it's too early to say. The ECMWF model here calling for a weakening of El Nino, that is uh, you know, almost assuredly going to happen here before July. At some point, getting into Enso Neutral, the question now, is it going to weaken further? Do we get into a La Nina? There's some hints of that uh, happening now. I will say, you know, while we're sure that we're getting out of an El Nino, um, these forecasts of ocean temperatures in the tropical Pacific are not perfect, and we get these wrong at times. In fact, if I take you back uh, to the forecast from May of last year as to how quickly El Nino would develop, last year we were developing the El Nino, now we're weakening out of it. But if I show you the same forecast from May, a lot of these forecasts had El Nino developing much quicker than it did. Um, this dotted line is what actually happened. So we were really kind of at the lower range of this various uh, kind of forecast plume or the confidence interval, if you will. So it's not like you can draw a line right down the middle and say, hey, that's exactly what's gonna happen. In this case, we developed El Nino slowly through the summer and the fall, and that may have played a role in the early half of the season. We started dry. It didn't feel like an El Nino winter. The videos we weren't talking about typical El Nino things, specific jet extensions. Then all of a sudden, you know, a flip switched after we peaked in January, uh, and then we got a lot of that snowpack. So there are implications to these forecast errors here, and I'm not picking on this uh, one forecast here from the ECMWF. Um, you know, I won't claim my forecast was any better at this time. We just have a lack of uh, information. We can get different scenarios going out in the future, but we need to account for the different ones that could occur. So when I show you the same forecast now, it's not like we can have supreme confidence and say, well, this is exactly how this is going to unfold. There's a wide range of possibilities here. There's a possibility we remain above average here in those ocean temperatures, and we don't dip all the way into a La Nina. I think uh, right now, if we kind of look at the middle of the pack here, we're likely going to develop some cooler temperatures here in the eastern Pacific, get close to getting classified as La Nina at some point here uh, in 2024. It just remains to be seen if it's going to be weak, if it's going to develop into maybe a very strong El Nino. We're really concerned about drought risk in California. We just have to wait and see at this point. Uh, what we can say is if we look down at the sea surface temperatures and how they've been evolving over the last kind of 20 to 30 days, that's the video I'm showing you now. This is our El Nino in the Central Pacific. Uh, the warmer than average temperatures in the equatorial Pacific, kind of right in the middle here, that's the area we watch. This, if you look at the color and the color bar here, we're warmer than average. So we're in an El Nino. It's been weakening, but it's still an El Nino. Um, that's likely gonna be the case for a number of weeks ahead until we weaken out of these uh, warmer temperatures here. If you look closely, there's a loop kind of playing over the last two to three weeks here. We had a gap wind event here in the Panama. You can see some colder temperatures and those sea surface temperatures starting to spread via this eddy here in the East Pacific. That's not an, kind of an uncommon way that La Nina starts to develop here in the Eastern Pacific. Kind of at the same time last year, we were seeing El Nino develop in the Eastern Pacific with the very warm ocean temperatures off the coast of South America. Now flip the script here to spring of 24, we're talking about some colder, colder temperatures here developing in the uh, Eastern Pacific. Now, this isn't to say, okay, bang, we're going to be right into a La Nina going into summer, but these ocean temperatures are cooling. 
that's expected. If we're going to get out, out of El Nino, we're going to have to cool the ocean temperatures here that are warmer than average in the Central Pacific. And we're seeing that unfold now into March. Uh, we'll see it continue into April and then into May. The question becomes, uh, does this continue into a full La Nina? We'll have to talk about the implications from that uh, going into the next water year. Does it say something more neutral uh, or perhaps the uh, those conversations get more muted going into fall uh, and winter? I'll leave you all um, here today. Thank you for watching. And I'll talk to you all next week.